Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to go over chapter seven, which talks about forecasting cash flow and developing a cash budget. Here are the main topics that we will cover in this class. Um, we're going to discuss different ways to implement sales forecasts. Um, most importantly is drawing from the sales forecast. We're going to develop forecasting about cash receipts and expenditures, and which will lead us to more detailed cash flow forecasts. Um, and we'll also touch back on uh, amortization. We learn about this in time value of money. We'll see, we'll see how that is tied into cash flow forecast. Um, and then we will evaluate different financing alternatives. Uh, one very important thing about cash flow forecast is that it's an iterative process. First, let's take a look at a few of the important decisions that you need to make before you conduct your forecast. One of them is the frequency. So how um, this means how uh, the duration of the forecast. So the frequency can be weekly, monthly, or quarterly. Uh, you do the the larger the business, the more frequent you you want to uh, conduct your forecast. But for most businesses, you should do at least a monthly forecast. Second is duration. Duration means uh, for how long will the forecast cover? Um, typically, this may be one or two years. So again, cash flow forecast is a much more uh, focused analysis. We will talk about longer term financial planning in the next chapter. Another thing to remember, very important for uh, cash flow forecasting is that it is an iterative process. And the goal is to ensure that the business does not run out of cash. An iterative process means that we'll, we'll come up with a, a first pass assumption and then we'll look at how does that, uh, how do those assumptions and operating strategy work out and frequently, frequently they may not work out or you may need additional financing. Then you go to the second iteration to find out if you do need to say borrow money, do you make enough money to afford the interest expense and the loan payment? If that is not acceptable, then you may have to change your operating strategy. And that is what we mean by an iterative process. And in addition to not running out of cash, planning ahead also enables the entrepreneur to take advantage of lower interest rates. So if you know that you're gonna need money ahead of time, again, we talk about the different sources of financing in uh, prior chapters. Uh, you do not want to get into a situation where you need to use expensive sources such as merch, uh, merchant cash advance. Instead, if you do your planning ahead of time, you can take out term loans, you can borrow from the SBA. So with planning and with well-documented um, uses of your funds, you have a much better chance of getting financing from a less expensive source. Here's a summary of, of the formulas from Table 7.1. This uh, includes the high-level concept structure of what cash flow forecasts involve. So first, let's look at, look at the inflows, meaning where do cash come from? There are two main sources. One is from your customers. So customers include cash sales and also collection from accounts receivable. The second is when you sell off equipment. So both together, the first part is your uh, uh, cash come from your day-to-day -day operation. The second is changes in your, your operate, operation due to sale of assets and, and equipment. And together that rep represents your total cash receipts. So these are all the cash that the, the company generate during that time. Second are disbursements. Disbursements means cash outflow. And this include payment to suppliers, uh, employees in the form of wages, government in the form of taxes, and so forth. Again, this is the day-to-day -day operation, um, cash payments. In addition to that, if the company purchase any equipment or fixed asset using cash, that is another use of cash. Together, that represents your cash disbursement. You take the receipt minus the disbursement, you have equal to your net cash flows. And to compute the cash flow for the business, you take the balance at the beginning of the period, add any cash that you receive, um, that becomes the total cash that's available. Less your, your, your cash disbursement, that is equal to your cash available before financing transactions. So this, again, this includes both your day-to-day -day operation as well as um, sales and purchases of equipment, but it does not take into account financing.
So financing can come from two sources. One is borrowing. So you add your cash from uh, new borrowing and you also subtract any payment on interest or debt. So the, the this cash flow on this side does not include financing. It's just operation and um, assets. And notice that we did take out cash dividend or owner's draw, but we did not include um, new owner's equity at this point. Um, the reason is that most of the time, um, the owner um, typically adding new equity is, is not a feasible option. Uh, again, we talk about the control and bringing in new investors. So when we do our cash planning, um, unless we reach a point where we really cannot continue to operate without new equity, uh, we're going to try to um, look at all the other sources such as borrowing and maybe even selling equipment or um, changing our accounts receivable policies to increase cash flow. So those are all operating strategies that we look at and get um, adding new um, equity is the very, very last resort. So it's typically not part of your uh, regular routine uh, cash flow forecast. This chapter covers two main sections. One is cash flow forecast for a new business, and the second is cash flow forecast for an existing business. Uh, there are some important differences. Most of it has to do with what data is available. So first, we're going to take a look at cash flow forecast for a new business. Um, the source of data include uh, primary source. Primary source means that the entrepreneur get this data directly from the source. So this may include focus group. Um, it may be from the mentor of the of the entrepreneur, meaning somebody that the entrepreneur knows in the industry who has been um, in the business um, and, and therefore can give the entrepreneur um, firsthand personal experience and information. Um, they can also get information from the city hall or town hall. They have a wealth of information, including demographics, uh, tax data, traffic information. So this is often a place that an uh, entrepreneur can go and get data that is freely available to anyone. In addition to getting data from a primary source, um, they can also obtain secondary source data. This will be available um, in publicly available um, databases or, um, or they may be um, available for sale. So market research for industry, um, they may obtain industry averages. Um, a lot of times, um, the trade association of a particular industry uh, will put out publications. A lot of this does is not free. You do have to pay for it, but they are uh, contain a lot of useful information. Uh, there, for example, if you are interested in opening up a restaurant, the National Restaurant Association has a lot of publications and have done a lot of market research. In addition to trade association, you can oftentimes also get macroeconomic trends and demographic trends from government sources. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, Bank is a good place to go to look at macroeconomic data, such as GDP growth, inflation rate, um, and um, the demographic trends, again, that you can get from the um, uh, the census, the government census, they can tell you um, a lot of information uh, is available. Next, we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna try this out and apply this in uh, cre uh, in creating a cash flow forecast for uh, the Tasty Taco, which is a company that is described in the textbook. So pause the video now and download the spreadsheet, and when we come back, we'll go ahead, we'll do the cash flow forecast for Tasty Taco together. Yeah, everybody ready? Okay, let's get started. Um, here is the template for table 7.3 to 7.7, .7, which covers the tasty taco. Uh, this is a slightly more complex spreadsheet, so there are two uh, type of information you're given. All the cells that are highlighted in light blue are cells that you need to put in formulas for. So these are to be completed by you. And cells that are pink are information that you're given. So let's take a look at the first tab, table 7.3. This is all pink, meaning that this is information that is given to you. You do not need to do anything with it, but you do have to understand what does it represent. Tasty Taco is a restaurant 
And the most common approach to forecasting sales for restaurants are based on average checks and also table turnover. So the, this restaurant has 20 tables and they assume that they will open 360 days per year. So these are operating assumptions. Um, depending on your projections, you may need to make modification to this. Um, average check is probably um, estimated based on either prime resource or, uh, or some kind of market research in the local area. And it seems relatively reasonable of uh, every check for $15. So if you're on average, you have a table of two. So there's two lunch um, for $15. Um, on, and then for dinner, two dinner will be $25. Um, and this is the average takeout order. The assumption about lunch, drink to food mix. So drink here is represents alcoholic beverage um, versus food. So what this means is that 10% of the lunch revenue on a Sunday will come from drinks and the remaining 90% will come from food sales. Uh, whereas in dinner, they expect 25% of the um, sales will come from alcohol and 75% will come from food on a Sunday night. Uh, notice that it's slightly different on a Friday night. They expect 40% uh, of the revenue will come from alcohol and 60% will come from food. Next is turnover. Turnover meaning how many times a table gets seated. So a one-time turnover means that you will, uh, you will fill all 20 tables. Um, a two times turnover means that you will sit each table twice. So you have 40 um, tables of sales altogether. Uh, and here just simply the number of takeout orders. Uh, it's important to understand how the sales uh, forecast is based on so that we can use this data effectively. Next, we're going to go to table 7.4. Here's where we're going to use the data. So you're going to compute the weekly sales forecast for Tasty Taco. And here are the formulas or hint that was given to you. So the projected lunch sales. So on Sunday, um, so we'll do it for each day. Again, if you enter your formula correctly, what you can do is enter the formula for one day and then you'll be able to copy it for the rest of the week. So let's take a look at how do we compute food sales for lunch. So we said food sales for lunch is equal to the number of tables times the lunch average check, times the lunch turnover, times one minus the lunch food and uh, drink mix. So uh, I encourage you to either write this out or print this out so that when you construct your formula, it'll be easier for you. Okay, so to start the formula, we we'll start with the equal sign. Now all this information is located in table 7.3. So we're gonna go over to table 7.3. 7.3. So the first item we want to pick, out is, pick up is number of tables. So there are 20 tables times the average check. So lunch average check for Sunday is $20 uh, times the lunch turnover. So that's one for Sunday. And then times one minus the lunch drink versus food mix for Sunday. So that's B10. Now, let's take a look at this formula. The average check, $20, the drink mix 10%, and the turnover are all different from day to day. But the number of tables, the 20 table located in cell B4, will remain the same regardless of which day. So we want to make this cell so before the number of tables and absolute reference. And you can do that by pressing, so first you highlight that cell. So notice that my cursor is on B4, and then you press F4. So that becomes an absolute reference. Now we have the formula we want, we can press enter. Okay. So that we just created the formula for um, lunch for sale. I'll do it one more time for um, the lunch sale. So again, we start with the equal sign. Remember lunch drink sale is number of tables times average check times the turnover times the drink 
versus food mix. So again, we'll go to table 7.3. At this time, we know that number of table. So before we want it to be an absolute reference. So we can make that absolute right now by pressing F4. And we want to multiply that by the average check. And we want to multiply that by the turnover. And we also want to multiply that by the drink food mix. So now we finish the formula for um, the lunch drinks sale. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to um, pause the video and try to work out the formula for dinner food and dinner drink on your own. When you come back, we'll check your calculations. Welcome back. Is this what you have, 375 and 125? If you click on the formula, do you remember to put absolute reference here for uh, cell B4 in both cases? Okay. Next, we're going to look at uh, compute projected takeout for sales. So again, the formula down here says it's equal to the number of takeout orders times the takeout average check. So that's very straightforward. So we say equal. Uh, number of takeout orders is 20, 20 takeout orders on Monday, and the average check is $20. Okay. Next, we're going to compute the total projected food. So we're going to pick up the food sales for lunch, the food sales for dinner, and the takeout order. And drink sales, we're going to take um, the lunch drink sales plus the dinner drink sales. And then the to final total will be food plus drinks. So now we have compute computed the formulas for Sunday. And if you have used the um, absolute reference correctly, we can copy this uh, across all seven days. So I'll hold down the shift key and the control key and the down arrow key. Now I have highlighted the entire uh, column of cells that I wanted to copy. I can use Control C. And then next, I use, move the arrow key over one. And then you hold down the Shift key and then highlight all seven days. So that includes Saturday. And then use Control V. And that will copy um, all your calculations. So this. So all we have to do is enter the formula, create the formula for Sunday, and then we can copy it across the entire week. Finally, to compute the weekly total, we use the sum function. So we add up sum. Again, start with the first cell, and then hold down the Shift key and the Control key, and then you can use the arrow key. So again, if you are not comfortable using the arrow key, you can just hold down the uh, Shift key and just do one day at a time to highlight all seven days. So you're summing up the entire week. And we can use Control C, again, use the Shift key and the down arrow key, and then use Control V to copy it for the entire week. And now we have finished um, the weekly total. Just a note here, we do not use any rounding here. And so your answer may be slightly different from what you see in the textbook. Okay, now that we are done with table 7.4, let's turn over to table 7.5. Now, table 7.5 includes the assumption to be used in forecasting um, cash flow, so both and particularly forecasting expenses. So these are information you're given. Uh, one of the things that I want you to pay attention to is whether the expenditures are on a per year basis or a per month basis, and also when they are payable. Um, on this page, there's one information that we need to bring in from table 7.4. So we'll highlight that. We need the total weekly drink food sales and total weekly drink sales. We already, already created that. So all we have to do is just reference the cell we created. So to reference a cell, we start with an equal sign. And from table point four, total food sales is the $11,970. Again, do the same thing. Equal table, table 7.4, drink sales is 23.80. Table 7.5 and table 7.6 are much bigger tables. So you have to scroll up and down. So you can use the scroll key on your mouse or you can um, use the arrow key to see the entire um, spreadsheet. Uh, you need, uh, I'm going to ask you to take 
pause this video and take some time to really study all the assumptions that is on table 7.5. Otherwise, you will be really confused when we move on to table 7.6. Uh, so make sure that you take your time to fully understand what is included uh, in this table. OK, now let's turn to table 7.6. So the first cell that you notice in here is as um, June um, per, uh, of peak season. So uh, this is not really well labeled, but um, and that's what the video is for. This represents the percentage of the peak season. So if you go back to table 7.5, it actually tells you that in June, we expect sales to be 80% of the peak season. And in July, is expected to be 100%. And in August, it's also going to be 100%. Again, I encourage you to um, read the textbook. It provides a lot more detailed um, explanations. So here for uh, this cell, all we have to do is pick up the June percentage. So we start with the equal sign and then go to table 7.5. Uh, June is 80%, so that's June. Uh, July, we do the same thing. So go to table 7.5 for July. And then for August. Again, equal back here for August. So you may ask, why do we do that? The reason is you want to separate the assumption area from the model area. So all the assumption is included on this page so that in the future, when you have to do um, sensitivity analysis or what if analysis is a lot easier. Uh, in addition to that, if you need to make changes to the assumption, you just need to make changes on this one page. You do not have to go through the model. Once the model is created, um, and you check that the formulas are created correctly, you sh should minimize the need to change the formulas as much as you can. So the way that this model is set up, once you put in the correct formula, if you want to change your assumption or your operating strategy, all you have to do is change the values on the assumptions page. Okay, now let's take a look. Uh, let's uh, fill out the cash receipts and cash disbursements. So notice that this is a weekly forecast. So this is so each for so each each column represents a week. So the total sales we already did that, and again that's from table seven point four. So table seven point four we have a uh, weekly total foot sales, and then we want to multiply that by. The assumption that you make for that particular um, time. So for the month of June, we assume that the uh, sales is 80% of the peak season. And for drink, we do the same thing. We take um, the weekly drink forecast from table 7.4, multiply that by back to table 7.6, the 80% of the peak season. So that is our assumption for, or uh, that's our sales forecast for the first week in June. And the total sales is the sum of these two. So that's for June. And there are several ways for you to create the rest of this. Um, one way is to notice that this is the same for um, all four weeks. So you can make the cells absolute, and then you can just copy them over. So that's one option. So you can change the cell to be absolute after you've created the formula. So let me escape. So to change uh, values in the formula, you click on the formula by itself. And then when your cursor is right on the cell address, you can press F4. And Again, use your mouse to move the cursor to the next item and press F4. Now, do not use the arrow key. If you use the arrow key, you will actually change other items. So um, use the cursor. So once you, change, once you make that absolute reference, um, again, you do the same thing for drinks and press Enter. Uh, you can copy this over the next four columns. So use Control-C and Control-V. And you can do the same thing for July. So July is 
uh, really the same. You go to table 7.4. Again, we have our weekly total. This time, we're going to make that absolute. Times table 7.6, that is the 10%. And we do uh, the same thing. So for drinks is 23, the 2380, make that absolute reference, times the 100%, again, make that absolute reference. And that the total is the sum of the two. And I can once again copy this for the next five weeks. The, so this is, again, we need to scroll over a little bit to see the rest of the um, August. So you have four weeks. So the first week, again, is equal to table 7.4, weekly drink foot total, times the 100% for August. You'll notice that, and again, do the same thing here. You'll notice that right now the value is the same for July and August, but I'm creating the formula separately for July and August because later on I may change the assumption and change um, this August may not be 100%, August may be 90%. So I want to make sure that if I change the assumption for August, my formulas will still work. So you always want to make sure that your formulas are as robust as possible. Next, take, let, take, let's take a look at cost of goods sold. So if you have studied table 7.5, you know that cost of goods sold is a percentage of foot sales. So let's start with the equal sign. And you just scroll up. We see that cost of goods sold is 33.8%. So that's cell B8. And we know that that would be the same. So we're going to make that an absolute reference times back here of foot revenue. So, and we know that that would change from week to week, but it's always 33%. The same is true for cost of drinks. So we start with the equal sign. In table 7.3, we saw that cost of um, drinks is 29%. Again, I'm gonna use an absolute reference there. Multiply, so multiply um, by drink revenue. So that's from table 7.6. Okay. And the total cost of goods sold is the sum of these two. Okay. And this formula actually will be the same across every week because um, food and drink is considered a fixed percentage. So we can use control V to copy that for the entire uh, quarter of forecast horizon. Wages for staff, kitchen staff and waste staff, again, if you have studied ch uh, table 7.5, you will have a good idea what that is represented. So if you take a look, kitchen staff is 512 hours times 8%, I'm sorry, times $8 per hour. Next, we move on to wages and salary. If you have studied table 7.5, you would be relatively clear what, um, how to compute that. So let's do that together. Again, we start with the equal sign. And in table 7.5, we're told that um, they will work a total of 512 hours and at $8 per hour. It did not mention if they will reduce staff um, during the peak season versus the non-peak season. So the assumption is that they carry the same amount of staff um, every day. And they will get pay on a weekly basis. So we'll take uh, 512. We make the absolute reference because it's gonna be the same every single week times $8. Again, we're gonna make that the same every single week. So for kitchen and waste staff, that is the same every week. For owner salary, it's slightly different. So again, we're gonna start with the equal sign. Again, um, and you saw that in here is $60,000 per year payable bi-weekly on Mondays. So, which means that is $60,000 per year Bi-weekly means that they will get paid 26 times because they are 52 weeks per year. So we just divide that by 26. 
again, we can make that a, an absolute reference. Okay. What is unique about this is you don't get paid every week. You, you get paid every other week because you get paid per weekly. So you can still copy this over. So you can use control C, but you will go over every other week. So control V to paste. So again, every other week. And this may be different across different weeks. So it's not always the first week of the month, but it's every other week. Okay, and the total is just the sum of these two, and we can copy that across all the entire quarter. Next, we're going to take a look at payroll taxes and benefits. Payroll taxes is a fixed percentage. So again, the information is in table 7.5. We start with the equal sign. So payroll tax is 12.42% for all employees. So it's the same 12.42%, so we can make that an absolute reference. Multiply that by the total amount that you have paid your employees. Okay. And you can copy this again, just like before, over the entire quarter. So for many of these uh, formulas, you only need to create the formula once and you apply it to every single week. Uh, employee benefits is slightly different. Again, we start with the equal sign. Uh, in table 7.5, we saw that uh, employee benefit is $12,000 per year and it's payable on the first of each month. So we have to look for the month. So again, make that an absolute reference, but it's pay each month. So we need to divide that by 12. And you'll pay on June 1st. Okay, that's our first month. And then we look again, you'll, the next payment will be July 1st. So we go to July 1st. And then the next payment is gonna be August 1st. And that will cover the entire uh, forecast period because that ends in on August 30th. So not all payments are the same. And then now we can add up the total, total wages and benefits. So that will be the sum of this three cell. Be careful, do not double count this because the $6,404 already included both kitchen and waste staff as well as the owner. And once you created that, we can copy that for the rest of the quarter. And the rest of this information is also provided for, from table 7.5. The next part from advertising, rent, all the way through office accounting and technology is relatively straightforward in the sense that the payment um, is described in table 7.5. So let's take a look. So notice that it tells you how often you get paid. So if it on, is on a per month basis, then you have to pay it on the 15th of each month, the first of each month, and so forth. Insurance is paid on a per year basis. So it's a $10,000 per year, and you pay it on January 15th. Now, if you look at our cash flow forecast frequency in this, um, in this particular horizon, it does not include the month of January. So we will not have to pay insurance during this particular forecast period. Workman's comp is paid quarterly. So you divide the $10,000 by four and is paid on the first of each quarter. So you pay that um, only in January, um, April, July and September. So I will show you how to do one and then ask you to do the rest um, on your own. And you can come back and check the answer. So let's start with advertising. Remember in table 7.5, it tells us that advertising is payable on the 15th. So we'll look, look for 15. So June 15 is here. We start with the equal sign, equal advertising, $500, so we make that absolute reference. So we'll, we'll copy that, so Control C, uh, to the next 15, so this is the week that contains July 15, and also here where it contains August 15. Okay, so you can do the same thing for the rest up to Office Accounting and Technology. When you come back, I'm gonna show you how to compute the um, expenses for credit card charges. 
Okay, is this what you have? So again, uh, pause for a second if you want to double check that you have the same um, information and they are located in the same um, months or qu and quarters. Um, so notice that there's no insurance payment, but in, uh, you have licensing payment because that is due on July 1st of each year. Next, we're going to take a look at credit card charges. So credit card charges, let's first take a look at what is given to you, is 2% um, of sales immediately and is um, of all your sales, 40% is done through credit card. So to create this formula, again, we're going to start with the equal sign. Um, our sales, total sales is up here, 11480 we're going to multiply that by, first of all, 40% of that. So we use 40%. Again, we're going to use absolute reference. And it will cost us 2%. So multiply that by 2%. Once again, we'll use absolute reference. And that is our credit card charges. And we can copy that to all the weeks in this quarter. So again, and that is um, actually sometimes it's easier. Uh, the next two are similar to what we've done above. Uh, we have supplies um, as well as equipment leasing. So notice that supplies is $5,000 per year and it's estimated to be paid once per month on the 1st. So we have to divide this by 12 and this is recorded on the 1st of month. So again, we go to the 1st of each month. We start with equal. Go back to table five. So it's $5,000. Make that an absolute reference. Divide that by 12. Okay, we'll copy this to the first of each month. So we, again, if you don't remember, you will need to um, reference up further. Make sure you're putting it on the first. Next, we have equipment leasing. And here it says, is $10,000 per year payable monthly on the 15th. And this is quite common. You oftentimes will have many payments on the 1st and the 15th. So we start with the equal sign. Equipment, make that absolute reference. Divide that by 12 because that's what the instruction told us. And again, that is payable on the 15th. And now we have um, all the dis cash disbursements. So the total cash disbursement is equal to um, total cost of goods sold and plus total wages and benefit plus the sum of all the other expenses. And once you have the total disbursement, you can compute your net cash flow. So net cash flow is equal to receipt. So equals receipt is your sales receipt minus your total disbursements. Okay. And we can copy this and then extend that to the entire quarter. And here you see the reason why we need to do a week by week um, cash flow forecast. You see that some weeks we have a, a lot of outflow and some weeks we have our inflows are higher than our outflows. So um, you need to make sure that you have enough money to cover your expenses, which will lead to our next topic, which is the cash budget. The beginning balance for the cash budget is given to you for the first week. This was carried over from the last week. Uh, the next item is projected sales received, which again, we have computed that, so we can start with the equal sign. Um, we expect to get uh, 11480 And your total cash available, remember um, the formulas in table 7.1, um, so is equal to the beginning balance plus the cash receipt. And then total cash disbursement, again, we have computed that for the week, is equal to our total cash disbursement for the first week is 17,696. And cash available is equal to total cash available minus cash disbursements. Uh, for now, we're going to not put in any of this item because we, we didn't currently we don't have any debt and we don't have any interest payment. So our end, but we do want to create a formula so that it will be correct. 
So the ending balance is equal to um, the cash available before financing. Again, all these formulas is in the textbook. Um, plus cash from borrowing, borrowing um, minus cash payment for interest and minus um, payment to principal and minus any cash that the owner takes out. Now we have completed the estimation for the first week. We need to do it for one more week and then we can, we can copy the formula for the remaining weeks. The beginning balance for the second week is equal to the ending balance of the first week. So we just use the equal sign here. It's e so this is the beginning balance is equal to the ending balance. Okay. The rest of the formula is the same. So we can just copy it over. So use the shift key and highlight all the remaining formulas. Control C to copy and then Control V to paste. Uh, you can always double check to make sure that the, the, you are referencing the correct cells and you're picking up the co correct values. Once you have computed the second, row, uh, second column, you can highlight um, all the entire cells and copy so control c again use the hold down the shift key and use the arrow key to extend to all the weeks and then press control v and now you have finished the cash budget so as the owner you can take a look at um, what your cash balance looks like and what you're comfortable with you can make adjustment if this is too low and you can uh, borrow money uh, it, as an owner you can also do some personal financing planning you are taking out a very low salary um, you notice that you're taking out only um, you know, $2,300 um, every six months, that's, um, that's only $60,000 a year. Um, so you may, you may see the cash balance and say, well, maybe I can take out um, another $1,000 this week um, and I'll be okay. So this is part of the planning, both in terms of your own personal financial planning, can you take out money? Or if you need money, um, you can plan ahead and do the borrowing that is necessary. This concludes this uh, video on cash flow forecasting for a new business. In the next video, we're going to look at cash flow forecasting for an existing business.